Hello and welcome back to another video. So today I'm going to be showing you how to build a gaming PC for under £600. And this is going to be a full step-by-step -step PC build guide where I'm going to show you how to put all the parts I've got in front of me together and come up with the working PC by the end of the video. So as well as showing you how to put everything together step-by-step, -step, I'm also going to show you how to install Windows 10, any programs and drivers we're going to need to get our PC up and running, I'm going to show you how to enter the BIOS. If our motherboard needs a BIOS update, I'll show you how to do that. I'm then going to show you how to adjust the fan curves so we can get our PC not only running silently, but also coolly. And I'm going to show you how to overclock the RAM. Following that, I'm going to run some benchmarks to give you an idea of the performance you can expect from this PC. So I'm going to go through the parts and tell you the parts I've chosen for today's build. But before I do that, I want to tell you about a great offer you can get on a Windows 10 Pro license key from CD Keystash. So if you head over to CD Keystash's webpage, you'll find a link to it in the description. You can currently get a Windows 10 Pro retail key for only $24.99, which is a saving of 87% of the recommended retail price. What's so great about the retail version is it isn't locked into a particular motherboard. So though you can only use your license key on one computer at a time, you can move it from one motherboard to another. What's even better, if you use my promotional code, which is CF20, you'll get a further 20% off the already great price. And I'll show you how to use your product key later on in the video. Okay, so let's have a look at the parts I've chosen for today's build, starting off with the case. For the case, I've gone with Lian Lee's Lancool 205M, and the M in the name means this is a micro ATX case. Although this is a budget case, which I managed to pick up for only $43.99, it actually has a very high build quality with a metal body and tempered glass side panel. The case also comes with two included case fans, so you're not only getting a great looking case, but you're getting great value for money. So as we've got a micro ATX case, we're going to have to go with a micro ATX motherboard. And the motherboard I've decided to go for is by Zeus. It's the Tough Gaming B450M Pro 2. And I managed to pick this motherboard up for only $74.99. Now the two in the name is very important. This indicates that this is the revised version of the motherboard. And as Zeus updated some of their B450 motherboards recently with a whole host of new features. And actually this version is very similarly priced to the original version. So this is the one you're going to want to go for. The reason I've gone for this motherboard is I think one, it's a great looking motherboard. Two, it offers a lot of great features. In particular, it's got two M.2 SSD slots. And with the new revised version, having a BIOS flashback button means from new, once they update the BIOS, you're going to be able to use it with Ryzen 5000 series CPUs. So you've got a good upgrade path in the future. Another nice thing about this motherboard is it's compatible with Ryzen 3000 series CPUs right out of the box. With some other B450 motherboards, you're actually going to have to update the BIOS before it will run a Ryzen 3000 series CPU. And because most of them don't have BIOS flashback buttons, that means you're going to have to get an older 2000 series CPU, update the BIOS before you're going to be able to install a 3000 series CPU. So this is going to save us a whole lot of hassle. And this feature is going to be particularly useful given the CPU we're planning on using in this build. For the CPU, I've gone with the Ryzen 3 3100. This is a four core, eight thread CPU, and I think it's widely regarded as one of the best budget gaming CPUs that you can buy at the moment. So I managed to pick this CPU up for just under hundred pounds. And one of the great things about this CPU is it comes with a CPU cutter in the box, and we're gonna use that in today's build. At the time of making this video, this particular CPU, like every other computer component at the moment, is in short supply. But feel free to change it out for whatever 2000 or 3000 series CPU you can get your hands on and you still should be able to follow along with the build guide. For RAM, I've got 16 gigabytes of Team Group's T-Force Dark Z gaming RAM at 3200 MHz speed. So not only does this RAM perform well, but it looks great. And I, in fact, I used this exact same kit in a 3000 pound PC build recently, primarily for its looks. So you should be able to pick up this kit for just under £75. So for a build in this price point, I would recommend 16 gigabytes of RAM. And Ryzen tends to like faster RAM, so I would go with 3200 megahertz as a minimum. So this kit is absolutely perfect for this build. 
For storage, we're going with a single drive. It's the P5 from Crucial, which is an NVMe M.2 SSD in 500 gigabyte capacity. So again, for a build in this price point, I would recommend an NVMe drive as your boot drive. The price of these drives has come down significantly over the last couple of years, and it's only a few pounds more expensive than a SATA drive. And for that, you're maybe getting six to nine times the speed of a SATA drive. An important word of caution when you're looking for these drives, be careful because M.2 SSD does not necessarily mean NVMe. There's also SATA versions of the M.2 drives which are going to perform at a similar speed to a standard 2.5 inch SATA drive. So if you are going to look for alternatives, and I'll put a link to some alternatives in the description, um, it's the NVMe drive that you want to get the best performance and it's only a few pounds extra than a SATA drive. So 500 gigabytes should be plenty of storage to get started with. And if you find yourself needing more storage in the future, you can occupy the second M.2 SSD slot or add a SATA drive to the build. So the most expensive part of any gaming PC should be the graphics card. And I spent just under £190 on our graphics card. It's the MSI Radeon 5500 XT. And I've got the 8GB version here, which should offer some great gaming performance. So again, at the time of recording, graphics cards are in incredibly short supply throughout the world at the moment. So you're unlikely to just be able to go out and pick up this exact model. Um, if you do want to go with an alternative card, the installation process should be very similar. The installation of the drivers for an AMD card should work fairly similar to what I'm going to show in the video. If you go with an NVIDIA card, have a look at one of my other PC build guides and I'll show you how to install the drivers for NVIDIA cards in that video. For the power supply, I've gone with a 550 watt power supply from Corsair. It's the CV550, which I managed to pick up for just over £45. So there's a few reasons I've gone for this power supply. The first is it's from a well-recognized company such as Corsair. And this is one area I wouldn't try and save some money in by going for a power supply from an unrecognized brand. The second reason is it comes with all black cables, which is significantly going to improve the look of the build. So this is one area I wouldn't try and cut corners on by going for a slightly cheaper power supply. 550 watts is probably a little bit more power than this build is going to need. And in fact, this build would run fairly happily on a 450 watt power supply. That was really only going to save you about six pounds. And the advantage of going with a 550 watt power supply is that if you want to upgrade your components, particularly your graphics card in the future, you're probably not going to have to update your power supply. So as we've mentioned, our case comes with two case fans included. There's one at the front and one at the rear. And while the fan at the front is going to do a great job of driving cool air over our CPU cooler, it's going to struggle to do that to the GPU. And the panel at the bottom of the case is solid. So I think our GPU is going to struggle without adding a second intake fan at the front. So I've picked up a second case fan from Antec. It's their P12 at the cost of five pounds. Now the only slight problem with that is our motherboard does only have two case fan headers and we've got three case fans now. So I have picked up a double fan splitter cable at the cost of three pounds, which is going to allow us to plug all three of our fans into the motherboard. So that brings the total price of our build to just under 600 pounds. I do want to include one option at the end and that is some black and yellow cable extensions from Shackmod. I picked up one for the 24 pin connector to the motherboard and one for the graphics card. Um, that came to a total of £21 and that would take our budget over £600, which is the reason I'm including it as an optional extra. I think it's going to significantly improve the look of our build and the black and yellow theme is going to go very well with the tough gaming motherboard. Um, like I said, it's an option, so I am going to show you how to build both with and without the cable extensions. Okay, so that's all the parts. Let's get on with the build. The first thing I like to do in any build is to prepare the case. By that, I mean removing any panels or dust filters that are going to get in our way during the build. So let's go ahead and get these panels off. The tempered glass side panel was held on with two thumb screws at the back of the case. Once the thumb screws are removed, this panel can simply be slid backwards and lifted away. It's a similar story with the other side panel. We've got two thumb screws on the back. Once they're removed, the panel can simply sit backwards and lift it away. 
The front panel can simply be pulled off from the front <coughs> and there's a magnetic dust filter on the front which can simply be pulled away. There's a second magnetic dust filter on the top which can simply be lifted away. You're going to need to do this if you're going to install fans at the top of the case. We're not going to do this so I'm going to leave this dust filter on for now. Our third dust filter is down the bottom over the power supply's intake fan. It's held on with a series of clips around the outside. To remove it we just simply need to free it up from the clips and pull it away. There's no reason for us to remove this dust filter for our build, so I'm going to go ahead and put it back. The reason I've shown you how to remove it is you're obviously going to need to remove these to clean the PC on a regular basis. In the front of the case we've got an instruction manual. At the rear we've got an accessory bag. I'll go ahead and show you what's in the accessory bag. So this is what's contained in the accessory bag. The first lot of screws A. Um, they are small screws without a fully round head. There's a little bit of a lip around the outside of them and they're for mounting your motherboard to the case and also for mounting two and a half inch drives in the hard drive cage. The next lot of screws B are for securing the power supply to the case. You can also use them to secure the graphics card to the case. Screw C looks fairly similar to screw A but it's got a fully rounded head with no flat edge around the outside. It's for securing three and a half inch drives to the hard drive trays. Part D is some cable ties for cable management. We're going to need to use part E and F together. Part E is some screws, part F is some rubber anti-vibration mounts and they are for mounting two and a half inch drives to the dedicated two and a half inch drive mounting slots at the back of the case. There's also two additional standoffs for securing the motherboard to the case that have been included. Um, they're not labeled with a part letter. I just want to point out a couple of features at the back of the case, although we're not going to use them. We've got two dedicated mounts here for two and a half inch drives, and we've also got a hard drive cage down the bottom where we can mount three and a half inch or two and a half inch drives. The next thing for us to do is to start work on the motherboard. We're going to do as much work on the motherboard as we can while it's on the flat table, but it's much easier to work on it here than it is in the cramped confines of a case. So we're going to go ahead and put our CPU into the socket in the centre of the motherboard. We're going to put the CPU cooler on that came with the CPU in the box. We're going to install our RAM into these sockets here and our M.2 SSD into these sockets all before we put the motherboard into the case. The first thing to do with this motherboard is there's a little bit of plastic protection here which we're just going to remove. Okay, our CPU is going to go into this socket in the middle of the motherboard. To prepare the socket to receive the CPU, all we need to do is lift this lever all the way over to the right hand side. So before we go ahead and install our CPU in the socket, I want to point something out about the socket. If we look at this corner over the top left hand side, you'll notice there's a little triangle mark on this corner. None of the other corners in the socket have this mark. So we're going to use this mark to line our CPU up in the right orientation in the socket. This is our CPU and what you'll notice is I'm holding it by the edges. The reason for that is I don't want to damage these gold pins on the bottom of the CPU. If I do that I can make the CPU absolutely useless. The other thing I want to point out, if you look at the corner of the CPU which is now at the top of the screen, it has a little gold triangle on it. None of the other corners of the CPU have that gold triangle. And then if I turn it back over, what you'll notice the corner that was at the top is now down at the bottom left hand side and there's a little gold mark on that corner of the CPU. So that's the mark we're going to line up with the mark on the socket. So I've got the mark on the CPU lined up with the mark on the socket. All I'm going to do is hover the CPU over the socket until it falls into place. Important, I'm not going to go pushing it in, I'm just going to move it about gently. And at one point, like it has now, it's just going to fall into the socket. I'm not going to go pushing down on it where I risk damaging the pins. To install the CPU, all I need to do is close the little lever. And we've now installed our CPU. The next thing for us to do is to go ahead and install our M.2 SSD. And this motherboard has two M.2 SSD sockets, one here and one here. Now both these sockets support Gen 3 speeds. To get Gen 4 speeds you would need to go with a B550 motherboard. But that's going to be outside the price point of this build. And also the drives are significantly more expensive. So although both the sockets in this motherboard support PCIe Gen 3 speeds, they aren't created equally. The socket at the top has four PCIe lanes, while the one at the bottom only has two. So we're going to want to install our drive into the top socket to give it access to the fastest speeds. The other important thing to look at is when you install a drive in an M.2 board, particularly in a B550 motherboard, where PCIe lanes are going to be limited, you want to look and see if there's any consequences, and there is for both these sockets. 
In the top one, when you install an M.2 drive, SATA ports 5 and 6 become deactivated. If you occupy the bottom socket, SATA ports 3 and 4 become deactivated. So although our motherboard has 6 SATA sockets, if we were to install 2 M.2 SSDs, we'd actually only be able to use 2 of the 6 SATA sockets. So that's important to know. The first thing for us to do is to put a standoff into the motherboard to secure our M.2 SSD. So I'm just lining the M.2 SSD up with the socket and I can see it's this end one here that we're going to have to put the standoff into. Okay, I'm just going to go ahead and screw the standoff into the motherboard. Next, to install our M.2 SSD, we just want to insert it at a slight angle into the socket. Next, we can go ahead and secure it into place using a screw from the motherboard box. And then you can see the reason that I've gone with this particular M.2 SSD for this build. I think the black on it blends in very nicely with the motherboard and it doesn't look out of place. If we had gone for a drive with maybe a different colour, it would have stood out like a sore thumb. The next thing for us to do is to go ahead and install our RAM. Looking at the motherboard, we've actually got four sockets, but our kit of RAM only has two sticks. We can't just pick and choose which of the slots we go into. Um, it's important you refer to your motherboard manual to see which of the two slots you should occupy. In general, it's the second and fourth slot along from the CPU that you're going to want to occupy if you've only got two sticks of RAM. And I've looked at the manual and that's exactly what we should do with this motherboard. So we just need to go ahead and open the clips on the second and fourth slot. So this is our RAM. What you'll notice, there's two gold connectors at the bottom of it and that's what's going to plug into the motherboard. What's really important is the two connectors aren't of equal length. The one over to the right is slightly longer than the one to the left. So it's important we line the RAM up correctly in the socket to avoid any damage. Okay, to install the RAM, we just need to line things up with the slot. Once we're happy we've got everything lined up, we just need to apply some firm pressure to the top of the RAM and the clip will close and lock it into place. Same process with the second stick of RAM. Go ahead and line things up in the socket. Once we're happy, everything's in the right place. Some firm pressure to the top of the RAM and again, the clip has closed, securing the RAM in place. Next thing for us to do is to install our CPU cooler. We're going to need to remove these clips from the motherboard. Each of them is held on with two screws. Importantly, don't throw these away because if you want to change your CPU cooler or sell your motherboard, you're going to need them. So the best place to keep them is in the motherboard box. Okay, so this is our CPU cooler. What you'll notice if I turn it over, it's got thermal paste pre-applied to the bottom of it. So we're not going to have to add any more. It's really important we don't touch this when we're installing the cooler so we don't damage the thermal paste. Next we just want to line the cooler up with the motherboard backplate with the AMD logo facing all the way over to the left hand side. We're going to apply a little bit of pressure to the top of the cooler and then we're going to screw, just getting the screws to take on one corner and then the opposite corner and then we're going to go to this corner. And the idea is you only want to tighten the screws up a little bit at a time so you don't apply too much pressure to any one side of the socket at once. So we've got all those screws to take so all I'm going to do is give one side a couple of turns then the other side and just repeat that process. Okay that's all four corners fully tightened. The next thing for us to do is to plug this fan connector into our CPU fan header, which is this connector at the top of the motherboard. Okay, so we just need to line things up with the socket. You'll notice there's little notches on the header and notches on the cable, so there's only one way it can go in. Last thing I'm going to do is just tuck this cable in so it's out of the way. So we're now ready to go ahead and put our motherboard into the case, but we've got a couple of jobs we need to do first. The first is we're going to need to make some adjustments to these standoffs at the back of the case. And these standoffs are designed to secure your motherboard to the case. Screws go into the standoffs and hold the motherboard in place. We're going to have to add two additional standoffs from the accessory bag, one to here and one to here. Um, we're also going to need to move this standoff here and down to the slot below it. Now we shouldn't have any problem adding the additional standoffs in without any tools. We can probably actually tighten them by hand and that will be good enough. The problem is we're not going to be able to untighten this one by hand. It's too well secured in. And unfortunately this case doesn't come with the adapter that lets you move the standoffs. I do have one from another case. 
Um, alternatively, if you don't want to pick up one of the adapters, you may be able to free this up with some pliers. So that adapter works by just placing it over the standoffs and then you can use a standard screwdriver into the adapter and then that lets you loosen the standoff and remove it. We can then go ahead and screw the standoff into the slot below and tighten things up with the adapter. I'm just going to go ahead and add in the extra two standoffs and then we'll just tighten things up with the little adapter. The other important thing to point out is the middle standoff looks slightly different to the rest of the standoffs. It has a little bit protruding from it and the idea with this bit is it's to pass through the hole in the middle of the motherboard and once you've got this through the hole in the motherboard it helps hold the motherboard in place. It does have a screw hole in the middle of them. Some of these are solid in certain cases with no hole. This one does have a hole so we're going to have to screw it in as well. The next thing to install is our motherboard's I.O. shield. It's going to go into this cutout here at the back of the case. Importantly, you're going to want it with the three circles at the bottom and take care not to cut yourself while installing it. So I'm just going to turn this round and line it up with the back of the case. Then I just need to apply some firm pressure to it. Next, we just need to go ahead and line the motherboard up with the I.O. shield and then try and get this middle standoff into place. So that's the middle standoff in. So you can see now once it's in place, the motherboard's actually holding itself. So I'm just gonna go ahead and get a screw in through that middle standoff. And then we can go ahead and put the rest of the screws in to the motherboard. The next thing I like to do in any build is to plug in the case cables. And these are the case cables which come from the front I.O. ports at the top of the case. So we've got a HD audio cable and we need to plug this in to allow the headphone and microphone jack on the front of the case to work. We've got a USB 3.0 cable which we need to plug into our motherboard to allow the two USB type A ports on the top of the case to work. And then we've got the tricky front panel connectors. The reason I say they're tricky is we've got all these different wires which need to go onto the one header on the motherboard. What these do is allow your power switch to work, your reset switch to work, your hard drive indicator LED to work and also your power LED to work as well. Okay so the first cable I want to plug in is our HD audio cable so I'm going to bring it through the cutout closest to the header and the header we want to plug in is this one all the way over to the bottom left hand side of the motherboard. We're going to want to plug our HD audio cable in with the HD audio text facing up the way. So I'm going to go ahead and line things up with the header and apply a little bit of pressure and then I can pull the excess cable out the back. Next cable to plug in is our tricky front panel connectors. So I'm going to bring them through this cutout and they're going to go into this header here down the bottom of the motherboard, the one just to the left of the SATA ports. Now it's really important you refer to the diagram in the motherboard manual so you plug these cables into the right pins on the header. So the first one we're going to plug in is the hard drive LED cable and it's going to go into the bottom row starting off at the left hand side. It's the hard drive LED positive followed by hard drive LED negative. So we're going to have to plug it in with the hard drive LED text facing down the way. Next to that we have the reset switch. It doesn't matter which way it goes in so I'm going to plug it in also with the text facing down. And that's on pins three and four from the left hand side on the bottom row. Okay, moving on to the top row, starting from left to right. The first pin is for power LED positive, followed by power LED negative. And these cables do come in two separate parts. Doesn't matter which way the text is because these are two separate pins. Next two pins are for the power switch. It doesn't matter which way it goes. I'm just going to plug it in again with the text facing down. The next cable to plug in is our USB 3.0 cable that's going to go into this socket here down the bottom of the motherboard. Now if you look carefully at the bottom of the socket you'll notice there's a notch and if we look at the cable there's also a little notch on the cable so we're going to have to make sure we line these up. 
Now be really careful when plugging this cable in, the pins on the socket are really easy to bend so the cable doesn't go easily, stop, readjust rather than applying any force because if you damage these pins your front IO ports aren't going to work. So I'm just going to line things up and apply a little bit of pressure. And that's the cable into place, pulling the excess cable out the back. The next thing to plug in is our case fans. We've got one at the front and one at the back. We are going to add an extra case fan down the bottom here. Um, this motherboard has two fan headers. We've got one here and one here just below the CPU fan header. So we are going to have to use our fan splitter cable. So I'm going to go ahead and plug the double fan splitter cable into this header here beside the M.2 SSD. Next thing I'm going to plug the cable coming from this fan into one end. I'm then going to take the other end of the cable coming from the fan at the front of the case and run it out the cutout into the back of the case. I'm then going to pull it in through this cutout here and then plug it into the other end of the connecting cable. Okay, so that's the two flans plugged into the motherboard. All I'm going to do is pull the excess cable out the back. And then what we can do is we can tuck this excess cable in and out of the way. So there we go, that looks pretty tidy. So this is our additional case fan. We're going to install it down below the one that came with the case. Now importantly fans have a front and a back. This is the front of the fan because you can see the fan blades are unobstructed. This is the back because we've got these little bits of plastic blocking the fan blades. So air is going to come in from the front of the fan and out the back. So we're going to want to install this as an intake at the front just like the fan above. So we want the front of the fan facing the front of the case. So the fans at the front are going to bring cool air in. The one at the top for the CPU, the one at the bottom for the GPU and then our fan at the back of the case is going to exhaust the hot air out. The other important difference to point out about this fan, this particular fan only has a three pin connector. That's not a problem for us because it's got little notches on the cable and it's only going to plug into the right three pins on our four pin fan header. This is often a question people will have about fans. The only difference with this fan is we need to run it in DC mode in the BIOS rather than PWM mode. Because if this fan was left in PWM mode, it would run at 100% all of the time. But don't worry, I'll show you how to set it up when we get to the BIOS. Okay, so I'm just going to insert the fan into the case. And then insert the four screws that came with the fan. Now the important things with fans is you don't want to over tighten the screws. You just want to just tighten and no more. If you do over tighten it, you can bend the fan out of shape. And actually it's a common cause of fan noise. So what I'm now going to do is bring the excess cable coming from the fan out the back of the case. I'm then going to go ahead and bring the fan through this cutout at the top of the case and then plug it into the fan header below the CPU fan header. Okay, and then we just pull the excess cable out the back. So hopefully you can see the reason why I've added this fan in. If we had just run with this fan, our graphics card which is going to be sitting here with intake fans down the bottom, most of the air coming through here is going to be above the graphics card. So I think this additional fan down the bottom is going to be blowing some air along and help the graphics card get air, particularly when all this panel at the bottom is solid. This is our power supply. It's what you call a non-modular power supply. That means all the cables are plugged in. There's no option to unplug any of the cables that you're not going to use. Big advantage to this is cost. These tend to be much cheaper than semi-modular power supplies where some of the cables are plugged in. So looking at the cables we're going to use, we've got a PCIe cable which is going to plug into our graphics card. We have got two 6 plus 2 pins given a total of 8 plus 8 pins. Our graphics card is going to require one of these, so we're only actually going to need to use one of these ends into our graphics card. Our motherboard is going to require a 24-pin power connector, which is this cable here. And then we've got an EPS cable, 
which is going to give our CPU additional power and that's going to plug into the top left hand side of the motherboard. The other cables that we have are for SATA and Molex power. We're not actually going to need to use any of these. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to wrap these cables up with the cable tie that came on them originally. So I did mention cable extensions were an option for this build and I'm going to show you how to install the power supply both with and without them. All these really do is extend the length of the cables so the bits showing at the front of the case are going to have the nicer appearance to them. Although the cables that we've got with our power supply actually look pretty good. So if you don't want to use the cable extensions your power supply is ready to go. If you do it's just a simple matter of installing these onto the additional cables. Okay, so we'll start with our cable for the graphics card. We're just going to line the 2 and the 6 pin up on the PCIe cable. If we turn it over, you can see there's a little clip on this side. And if we look at our cable extension, there's a little notch on this side. So we're just going to line the two of them up together. And then push things into place. Okay, same thing for our 24 pin extension cable. There's a clip on the cable and a notch on the cable extension. So we go ahead and line things up. There we go. And then it's just a matter of pushing things into place. There we go, and that little clip has closed over. So we'll go ahead and get the power supply into the case. Okay, we're now ready to get our power supply into the case. What's important is this is our power supply's intake fan. So we're going to need to install it with this facing down the way. Remember, we've got a vent with a dust filter at the bottom of the case where it's going to get air. The top of the case above the power supply is solid. So we installed upside down, the power supply is going to struggle to get the cooler it needs. We've got the fan facing down the way. We're just going to go ahead and slide the power supply into the back of the case. Then we can go ahead and secure the power supply in the case using the four screws that came in the accessory bag. Next, I'm going to go ahead and plug the cable label CPU through this cutout on the top of the case. Okay, so we just need to line the cable up with the header on the top left hand side of the motherboard and then push it into place and then pull the excess cable out the back. Now the reason I didn't go for a cable extension as an option for this cable is you don't actually see very much of it in the build. Um, obviously if you wanted to there is an optional cable extension you can get for this power supply cable as well. Next we can go ahead and bring our 24 pin cable through this cutout here. Now importantly there is a little notch on the header which needs to line up with the clip on the cable. So if we bend things around this way and then go ahead and push things into place and then pull the excess cable out the back. And if you have gone for the optional cable extensions I'll show you what that looks like. You're just going to bring the cable extension through from the back line things up with the motherboard and then push into place. Now these cables have some cable combs designed to help you tidy up the cables and then you can just pull the excess cable out the back. Next we're ready to go ahead and install our graphics card but to allow us to do this we need to remove the second and third slot cover. To get access to these we need to remove the little bracket by loosening this thumb screw and then this bracket can simply be slid out of the way. So we can go ahead and loosen the screw on the second and third slot. Okay, with the screw removed, the brackets can simply be pulled away. Okay, so our motherboard does have two PCIe slots that could accommodate a graphics card. Obviously, in this case, you're not going to be able to put a graphics card into the bottom slot because it's going to be too close to the bottom of this case. But if you had a larger case, you could obviously put a graphics card in here. It's the same rule with the M.2 SSD socket. In general, you want to install your graphics card in the top slot because that's going to let it run at the fastest speed with the most PCIe lanes. And it's exactly the same case with our motherboard. Even if we had a bigger case where we could install it in this slot, it's the top slot that we want to install in. And that's why we've removed these two particular brackets. So to prepare the slot to receive the graphics card, all we need to do is open the little clip here by pushing it back. Then all we need to do is line the graphics card up with the slot. Once we're happy we've got things lined up it's just a little bit of pressure and the graphics card will clip in and the slot will close over. Then we can go ahead and secure the graphics card into place using the two screws we removed earlier on. 
And then we can go ahead and put this little cover back on and then secure it in place using the thumb screw. Next we need to power our graphics card and our graphics card has a single 8 pin connector on the front and as promised I'll show you how to do it both with and without the cable extensions. There's a little cutout here in the bottom of the case and that's where we're going to bring the cable through. Okay, so if we're using the standard power supply cables, I'm just going to insert it with the clip at the top, supporting the graphics card as I plug it in. Then what we will do is we'll pull the excess cable out the back, so this little additional power supply is going to be hidden down the bottom. Okay, I'll show you what that looks like using the cable extension. So I'm going to bring it through the cutout at the bottom. Again, support the graphics card while we plug it in. And then we're just going to use the two little cable combs to tidy up the cable. Final thing for us to do is some cable management. So we need to tidy these cables up so we can get the panel back on again. You can see there's little points here where we can use the cable ties that came in the accessory box to secure the cables. So we'll go ahead and do that. Okay, we can now go ahead and put the panels back on. Okay, so that's the build complete and I think it looks absolutely great. But does it run? So we've reached the moment of truth where we need to go ahead and flip the power switch and see what happens. Importantly, I have loaded a Windows 10 bitable USB drive into the back of the PC. If you don't know how to make one of those, I've made a video on it, and I'll put a link to that video in the description. Okay, here it goes. Okay, so that's a good sign. The fans are spinning. We've also got lights on the motherboard. So we just need to watch the monitor closely and see if we get a boot screen. So there we go. We've got the Tough Gaming logo appearing, which is a good sign as well. So the next thing we're looking for the computer to find the bootable USB drive in the back and boot off that. Obviously there's no operating system in the SSD that we have installed, so it has to find the bootable USB drive and boot off that. We're now getting the Windows logo on the screen, so it looks like it's found that drive. And this has taken us through to the Windows installer. So that's great. I'm now gonna show you how to install Windows 10, but to make things a little bit easier, I'm gonna flip over to the screen mode. Okay, so I'm from the United Kingdom, so I'm gonna leave all these as they're set and I'm gonna click on Install Now. So I'm gonna go ahead and enter the product key I got from CD Key Stash into here. And then click Next. I'm gonna accept the license terms. Click Next. And then we're gonna go for a custom install. So we have only one SSD and it's picked it up here. So we're gonna go ahead and select it and click Next. And then this process is gonna take a little bit of time, so I'll speed it up for you. Okay, I'm going to select a variety of options over the coming pages. Obviously, you have different options than me. Select the options that are relevant to you. So I'm going to select United Kingdom and click Yes. Uh, United Kingdom again for the keyboard layout. And I'm going to skip a secondary keyboard. Okay, I'm going to set this up for personal use. Click Next. And then if you have a Microsoft account, you can go ahead and enter your details here. If you don't have one, you can create an online account. Or if you want to just create an account without a Microsoft account, you can click offline account. I've got one, so I'm going to go ahead and put my details in. So at this stage, we can create a PIN to log in with instead of a password. And just type it in again. So I'm not going to use online speech recognition. I'm going to allow apps to use my location. Yes, to find my device. Uh, just the basic data, uh, no thinking, no again, and no again. And obviously if you have different options, like I said, go ahead and pick the ones that are relevant to you. I'm just going to go ahead and skip this. And I'm going to click do it later. And I'm going to only save files to this PC. And I'm going to say no thanks to the free trial. Uh, not now. Okay, so that's Windows installed. A pop-up has appeared asking us if we want to download the Armoury Crates. We are going to need to download this to control 
the lighting on our motherboard. So I'm going to go ahead and click yes. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and click I agree and accept. Okay, so while we're in this program, I'll go ahead and show you how to change the RGB effects on our motherboard. So if we click on Aura Effects, what we'll see at the moment, our motherboard is set to the pattern as rainbow. Um, if we want to change it to a static color, we can. So I'm going to go ahead and click Static. And then we can click on the color and pick which color we want. So I'm going to go for yellow because that's going to match the theme of our motherboard and our cable extensions. And then click OK. And then we can see on our motherboard the color has changed to yellow. There's only a very small bit of RGB just down the bottom right hand side of the motherboard. Okay, so normally I don't go ahead and install programs on drivers before I've fully updated Windows. The reason I did that was because the pop-up came up and it's going to save you having to find it at a later stage. So we'll go ahead and get Windows up to date. So we click on the Windows icon down at the bottom, click on Settings, click on Updates and Security, and then we're going to go Check for Updates. What we're going to do is Windows is going to find some updates. We're going to let it install Windows. It may need to restart a number of times, but we're not going to move on until Windows is fully up to date. Okay, so that's Windows fully up to date. When I click on check for updates, there's no further updates available. Um, a couple of other things to show you before we install some drivers. Um, if I click on activation, you can see I've got Windows 10 Pro activated with a license linked to my Microsoft account. So that means I'm going to be able to move it from one computer to another. The other thing I wanted to show you is we have only one SSD installed in this build. So if I go to this PC, you can see our drive is showing up as local disk C. If you did install another hard drive or another SSD, the chances are only one of your SSDs will show up here. Um, I've made a video on how to get the rest of them to show up, so I'll put a link to that in the description as well. Okay, so we're over on our motherboard's drivers and tools page on Azusa's website. And the first thing I'm going to do is download the BIOS. You can see there's four versions of the BIOS available. Um, two of them are still in beta version, so I'm going to go ahead and download the latest stable version of the BIOS by clicking Download. What I'm then going to do is go over to the Downloads folder, right click and click Extract All, and click Extract. I'm then going to go ahead and copy this file and go over to the external USB drive which I plugged into the computer and formatted it in FAT32 and paste the file here. So this means when we head over into the BIOS, if the version that I've got here is later than the one that's currently installed, we can go ahead and update it. Okay, so moving on to drivers, I'm going to go ahead and download the LAN driver. The chipset driver and also the VGA drivers I'm going to get directly from AMD's website. So I'll download the audio driver as well. And then you've got some options under the software and utility. If you want to download any of those, I'm not going to bother with these. SATA drive, we're not going to use RAID on this computer, so we don't need to download that. And there's the Armory Crate, which came up in the pop-up at the start of the PC. So again, if you didn't download it at the start when the pop-up appeared, you can go to here to download it later. Okay, so we head over to the Downloads folder, and there's the two driver files which we have downloaded. I'm going to right-click and go Extract All, click Extract, and then the same thing with the audio drivers. Right-click, Extract All, and then Extract. Okay, so you can see the folders that have been extracted. We don't need these compressed ones anymore, so I'm going to go ahead and delete them. So I'm going to start off with a LAN driver, click on it, go down and click on the Setup file. Click Yes, click Next, Install, and then we're going to click on Finish. Um, we're going to go ahead and install the audio drivers as well, and then we'll scan down. There's the Setup file, click Yes, click Next, and we're going to have to restart our computer. Okay, so that's all the drivers we want to install from Zeus. We'll head over to AMD's website. We can go ahead and get our chipset and graphics drivers by clicking Download Now. Now we head over to the Downloads, we'll double click on the icon, click Yes, and click Install. Okay, we're just going to go with the recommended version and click Next. Okay, we're going to go ahead and click Install. 
Okay, we're gonna go ahead and click on restart. Okay, so we've opened the Radeon software. I'm just gonna go for a quick setup and then I'm gonna go ahead and click for gaming and then hit continue. So what we can see, the version of the drivers that we have installed, I'm gonna go ahead and check for updates. So it's actually find an update. We'll go ahead and click download. Okay, we can go ahead and click on install. Click yes. And again, it's normal for the display to flicker during the installation of drivers. Okay, I'm gonna to have to restart our system, so we'll go ahead and do that. Okay, so that's all the programs and drivers installed that we're gonna to need to do, and Windows is fully up to date. Next thing for us to do is to visit the BIOS. To do that, we need to restart our computer. So I'm gonna click on the power options and click restart. What we're now gonna to want to do is hit the delete key once the screen goes black. And the idea is we need to time the delete whenever the logo just appears, but it's easier just to start pressing it to avoid missing it. Okay, it's gone black, so I'm starting to press the delete key now. And as the Tough Gaming logo appears, that's the time you need to hit it. Okay, so that's us into the BIOS. Now, the first thing I'm going to do is go into the advanced mode by hitting F7. So we can see the version of the BIOS that's installed, and we can see the one that we've got on the memory stick is a later version. So we're going to want to go ahead and update it. Um, importantly, you may not want to update your version of the BIOS. Um, in general, I only recommend doing it if the new version is going to add features that you need or you're having problems with your computer. Because if things go wrong during the BIOS update, you can actually brick your motherboard. Uh, particularly if your computer was to lose power during the update, there's a very real risk of you wrecking your motherboard. So I'm only doing this for completeness to show you how to do it in case you have to. So I'm going to go ahead and click on the tools. Click on the flash utility. And then we can see our version of the BIOS file here. So I'm going to go ahead and click on it. It's going to ask, do we want to read this file? I'm going to click on yes. And it's asked, do we really want to update the BIOS? So I'm going to click on yes. And then we can see the progress of the update down at the bottom of the screen. Okay, so that's the BIOS updated. I can go ahead and click on OK. Okay, so we can go ahead and press F1 to run the setup. Okay, so that's us back into the BIOS. The first thing I want to do is press F7 to get into the advanced mode. And what we can now see is our BIOS version has been updated. If we look over at the right hand side, we can see that our memory is currently running at 2400 megahertz. And our RAM can run at 3200 megahertz. So I'm going to press F7 again, and what we need to do is enable DOCP. So it's currently disabled. So if I click on it and click on Profile 1, what we can see now, we've got our RAM running at 3200 megahertz. Next thing for us to do is to go ahead and have a look at our fans to make sure they're running as we want them to. So what we can see is our CPU fan is currently running on the standard profile. If we want to run it on a silent profile, we would click here. Turbo, we can click here. If we want to run at a full speed, we click here. Or we want to manually adjust the fan, we can click on the manual and then we can drag these points to where we want them. At different uh, temperatures, the fans are gonna run at different speeds. I'm just gonna leave it on the standard profile for now. Next thing, we're gonna head over to chassis fan number one, and this is where we have plugged our three pin fan into. Now, at the moment, it is currently running in DC mode on the standard fan profile. So that's what we wanted to do. If we were to go ahead and enable PWM mode, because this fan only has three pins, it would run at 100% all of the time. We're gonna head over to the chassis fan two header, and this is where we've got our two original case fans plugged in by the double fan splitter cable. It's currently running in DC mode. It can run in PWM mode, and I'm gonna go ahead and enable PWM mode. And the reason we can do this is because it has four pin connectors on it. It's running on the standard profile. I'm just gonna leave it at that for now, and then I'm gonna press escape to exit. So to save our settings that we have changed and exit, all I need to do is press F10. 
So it's going to give us a summary of what we have actually changed up on the screen. And I'm going to click OK to accept. OK, that's us back into Windows. First thing to do is check our RAM is currently running at 3200 MHz. We right click on the Windows icon and click on Task Manager. Then if we click on More Details and click on the Performance tab and then click on Memory. So we can see the RAM is currently running at the 3200 MHz. OK, so that's the setup of the PC finished and everything's running really well. I'm now going to show you some footage of the completed build followed by some benchmarks so you can get an idea of the performance you can expect from the PC. So if you find the video useful, please give it a thumbs up. And if you're not currently subscribed to the channel, please hit that subscribe button and I'll see you in the next video.